My name's Dave Price and welcome to the True Life Business Show. And today's guest we've got is Chris Doughty from Sourcing Investments. Chris, good to meet you, sir. Uh, thank you very much and thanks for having me on. Uh, no, absolute pleasure. I'm really looking forward to this, actually, um, because I've got a bit of a property background myself. So, yeah, intrigued to find out more, guys, more about what you guys actually do. Um, so the, the first question we always kick this off with is how do you actually help people? It's a good question, David. Um, how do we help? I think as an entrepreneur, you know, you are always trying to, you know, find find solutions to problems. And the problems are, you know, something that you identify. For me, uh, being a property guy, um, my background is corporate, but then transitioned into, into property um, in around 2008, 2009. Um, and going through that journey myself, um, I'm giving you a bit of context as to why, what, how do we help people? is I found a lot of problems in my early days as a, as a property investor. You know, how do I find the right teams? How, how do I, even though I've been trained um, and, and went through an organization who, who give you the basics, you know, and all the challenges of, you know, builders, lawyers, uh, accountants, how do I actually turn this knowledge into actually something that practically um, is with the right people? Um, and how can I control it, you know, as I grow and, and create systems and, and, and actually to be a business because nobody actually shows you that. So that was the premise that I found. And then um, the sourcing investments really, I ended up helping and mentoring a lot of international clients who wanted to find the UK attractive. And um, again, a huge problem. We can teach them all they want. But then the question is, is from afar, how can somebody actually find a deal how can they then control every aspect of that deal from afar, um, whether it be finance, whether it be foreign exchange, whether it be having accountants or lawyers who actually know what they're doing mm -hmm. um, and all of the facets of property. And that was the real problem. So it was the same problem that resonated with me on a personal basis being in the UK um, and actually not investing in my own area. Um, I was at the time living in a place called Swindon and invested in in Plymouth and I'd never been to Plymouth before so even that sort of three and a half hour drive you know is not five minutes down the road so all of the same problems whether you were investing from New Zealand into the UK seeing it's applied you know whether I you know was investing three and a half hours down the road it's the same principle how can I control it how can I have visibility so we set up in solving this problem um, and you know including setting up companies, bank accounts, et cetera. And we provided all of that in, into a solution, which also included finding sourcing agents. And these are agents, not estate agents. These are agents who designate themselves to find potential pro investment property for investors. Um, highly unregulated market, highly, um, very wild, wild west. So again, there were some really good people out there, but unfortunately, like the majority, or you know, the minority spoil it for the majority is always things in, in life and humans. Yep. Um, so we wanted to bring, you know, those really good people to the forefront. How could we do that? So we verified all of these agents. Um, we then have gone on to uh, solve the problem of their compliance. That's another aspect. Again, we can, how do we help those guys? But what we ended up doing is creating a system which brought, Qualified investors, didn't matter where they were in the world or in the UK, and bring them together with qualified verified agents. So we were helping both sides of a marketplace, very similar to suppliers and buyers as Amazon. And that's what we wanted to do for the UK property market. Brilliant stuff. And it, it sounds like it's been actually built because of your journey in property investing yourself. It feels like that was the background. So how did you actually get into property in the, the first place? Oh, um, I was, uh, I did, uh, initially I graduated with uh, two degrees, one in international financial analysis, and that was my master's, and then my the other one, uh, biochemistry as an undergrad. Um, so yeah, not just a pretty face, um, not even that these days. And uh, anyway, uh, going into the corporate world, fantastic, you know, really got into it, um, and then was there for five years, and, and, and just, there was this part of me that just dawned was, you know, is this it? Is this is this life? You know that that genuinely freaked me out. That's the only way I can I can describe it. Panic. You know, is this what all of my schooling, 
all of my learning has led me to, you know, I could be here for the next 45 years of my life in this job. And would anybody care? And there's a big wide world out there. And how does that work? You know, so for me, um, after about sort of five years, um, set up another company with a friend of mine, a tech company, uh, right at the start of what I would call that sort of internet boom. Um, where I was, was on Dragon's Den and, and, and stuff like that on, on the BBC. Oh, wow. But so, uh, that's a different Dragon's story. Den. Yeah. Are you going to tell people about that one? <laughs> different story. That's a different story. <laughs> well, well, that. But again, you know, a highly, really successful, ended up raising one and a half million for it. It was a really amazing tech platform. And then unfortunately, 2008 came. So there was always in my mind this, this, this drive to learn more, want to, want to know more. And I think for me, when I looked at stuff is, is, is property for me just resonated because I like, I'm, I'm a, I get a lot of feedback myself from results and seeing things. So, you know, I can be all day long talking about, you know, implementing strategy, creating new business models for, you know, massive corporates and consulting, which I did as well. I get no real tangible feedback. So for me, actually seeing something, you know, I get more, more reward back from painting a wall and seeing that change immediately than I do, you know, uh, you know, saving, you know, a massive corporate millions of dollars because it doesn't feel as though it's very tangible to me. So for me, property was a real natural step of actually, you know, bricks and mortar made sense to me. My cousin was into it as well. So, you know, resonated with me. Um, so for me, yeah, property was a nice transition in, in 2008, 2009 and, and started, uh, started buying then. Um, I think looking back now, you're like, wow, that was a bit of a crazy time to leave the safety of corporate into when the world was blowing up. But uh, looking back now, I still have a number of properties from back then and, and they still remain to be, you know, um, uh, you know, the diamonds of my, of my portfolio. So, you know, time is everything in property in the UK. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It makes total, total sense. So you, it was really to escape the corporate world and actually create something useful and meaningful in your life and in others really then that was the driver. Yeah, and just that whole for me that 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 you know, I remember uh, you know doing training. And it was all about this thing called residual income. You know, it was you know passive income. You know where it, it came in because you didn't you, once you've set up the system or the process or or the asset which actually you know cash flows. Um, you know, a bit like you know investing in 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 stock. You know, and getting dividends. You know, it's that you're not. You're not working for it. You've done all the work. You've set it up, and and I think that really resonated with me. You know, um, you know, my time. I only have a certain amount of time in a, in, in a day, in a year, um, and if I'm trading that for for pay, um, well, how do I end? How do people end up owning multiple businesses or or, or big portfolios? You know, of a hundred. But how is that possible if you are simply trading your time for money? And nobody could ever explain that to me in a, in, a, in a clear, clear fashion. So actually sort of, you know, that awakening of, of that, it was just a different way of operating in life. And, but, you know, again, you know, it's all right talking about it, um, uh, but not many people actually do it. And, and, and I think that was, that was the itch that needed to be scratched in my life was how can I, you know, um, challenge the way i've been told that life is which is turn up for work work really hard get promoted and i love all that but then at the same time when i saw it within the corporate world the higher up you went the less time you actually had because the more successful you became everybody wanted more of you and i never understood that yet i looked at other people in my in my life um sort of my father's friends and stuff who had businesses and they seemed to have their own businesses more time the more successful that the company got mm. and i just for me just what's my path then so i think that was the you know as a vehicle i saw property as a vehicle um which tipped you know that tangibility aspect of me something that actually you know was there you could touch and feel and say that's mine um and also the fact of that you know as long as you pay your bills and your mortgage that nobody can take it away from you um and obviously being shown using leverage and mortgages and stuff like that. And, and, and yeah, so for me, building that, building systems, processes, renting, I mean, you're, you're aware of that, that aspect of the property game as well. Um, 
you know, all ticked all of my boxes as a person, what I need in my life, you know, problems and challenges and scalability. So yeah, that's, that's where it came from. And then sourcing investments was the next step. How can I solve it for the entire nation um, and actually solve the problem even internationally is, you know, how can people acquire properties from afar? So that was the, the journey. Love it. And as you say, property has always been tied into that passive income uh, route where you're not swapping your time for money, as you say. Um, in reality, how passive a property is or not um, can be a huge, huge issue, as probably both of us really know. <laughs> I think I, it's a good question. I think this is part of the journey that, that, that a lot of people, um, when they start out, you know, they are told by, you know, mentors, by, you know, people who, who deem to be experts, et cetera, that, you know, it's a dead smooth journey. And, and, and the more you build, the more, the more passive income you will get, et cetera. But it, like with anything, I think I always put it down to, look, you will always have problems to solve. And if you're working with somebody, you know, in a corporate environment, you've got problems to solve and solutions to create, you know. I think for me in property, it was it's the same. You're still going to have a lot of problems and a lot of responsibility, but you're you're solving your own problems, which actually means that you get the direct benefit of the finding the solutions for that. Now, you know, some people love that responsibility, some a lot of people don't. Um with regard to the passive income, I think for me, um it it, it still surprises me to this day, you know, like last month, you know. 16 grand drops into my bank account and i really wonder what what have i done for that i feel a bit guilty um and, and i still it's, it still doesn't sit with me well it really doesn't um because i still have that mentality i should be working really hard for that <laughs> but once you build the systems and people around you you know it, it, it is possible but you have to scale you have to scale because unfortunately it's a bit like anything with one, two, three, four properties, you know, um, that, that there's too much risk around the, the, the small minutia of those, you know, if one fails that, you know, if there's four properties, that's 25% of your revenue, you know, gone. Um, likewise, you know, all the other factors like, you know, which has hurt a lot of people recently over the last, I would say year and a half, um, you know, cost of, especially you, you, you have, um, an all-in-one bill solution, you know, for HMOs, houses of multiple occupancy, you know, um, cost of cost of living's gone up, you know, energy bills, um, and you're having to, you know, absorb that cost, you know, so suddenly your your margin is 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 being eaten into, you know, and more regulation and HMO, uh, um, what do you call it, licensing and stuff like that. So, you know, you have to be hyper vigilant to protect your income um, at the end of the day. So, is it completely passive? Um, I think it would get to be being completely passive when when you can get to a size where you can pay somebody 150 grand a year to look after your entire portfolio for you. And, and, and But then again, even at that, you'd probably still have questions and problems. So it's never completely passive. It's uh, it's an ideal. Hmm. Uh, in reality, um, I think uh, it, it, it just means that you're solving your own problems and that income hopefully is 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 you you've you've understood your your uh, what's the word your profit margins and 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 etc relative to the business so yeah i I would rather get you know my income like that than uh what's the word grinding and grinding with somebody else and and and, and being like oliver twist and saying you know yes please sir may i have more sir um for me i like taking the responsibility myself for my own decisions yep oh could you say the uh, the passive income i'm sure there'll be some people listening to this who maybe just bought one property uh, and realize it doesn't feel as passive as it should be at all. Actually, there's always constant problems, especially if they're trying to manage it themselves, et cetera. Whereas what's your view from somebody with literally a property having problems is creating a lot of hassle. How do you move from there to make it much more passive? Is it getting the right teams around you in systems or? It's, it's, <laughs> It, it, it's all about it's the same with any business and not just property you know it's that's when they talk about scalability having one you're right you you, you you've got every single problem you know um and 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 unfortunately the margins that you have on a single property unfortunately mean that you probably have to manage it yourself because the margins are too tight to get an agent in and taking you know 10 12 percent you know every month etc but as you scale 
um, to four properties, to, to 10 properties, for example, um, now the relative cost of all of all of the, the problems is a lot less. Um, mm. But then you can potentially say that you have more problems because now you've got 10 properties with a potential of like 40 tenants and, and stuff like that. The, the hassle never goes away. I think what you you end up doing is paying other people to take what I would call that first line hit. You know, so for example, you're not dealing with the tenant saying, oh, you know, I've got a problem with, um, you know, the water's not working or something like that. Somebody else is taking that phone call for yeah. you. Um, it doesn't detract the fact that you will probably end up still getting the bill, which yeah. is really annoying. But yeah, you never actually, uh, you never, it's never truly passive. It really isn't. It just means that you're in control of, of, uh, the situation in the sense of if you decide that you want to sell that property, you can, if you, you know, and, and that's for me, that control aspect that, that I like about it. You know, um, if I put my money completely all into pensions, um, that's locked. I can't do anything about it. And I, I'm completely at the, at the mercy of somebody else, um, you know, managing that money and, and the way pensions are performing over the last five years. It's, it's in my mind, the word disgusting, um, comes to mind with regard to, you know, the pension fund managers sit there, you know, um, saying it's the market. Well, you, you should beat the market, lads. You know, that, that's your entire job. But when you run a, you know, £10 billion, you know, a pension fund and you're making 2%, you know, um, management fee, well, do you really care about the performance, you know, when you've got that? And, and I don't know. I just sometimes I think, as I say, being in control of your own destiny is more important. Um, and 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 to say solving problems within your own life rather than just offloading it. And and then you get to sort of 60, 65, and you realize actually, if I had taken that responsibility myself, I'd be in control. And if I want to sell that property and it's worth 150 grand and I want that, that's fine. Um, can't do that with a pension. No, very, very true. So what would your advice be to um, somebody who's just toying with the idea of getting into the, the property market to begin with uh, as an investment? Yeah, good question. I think for me, property is the, the – there are multiple different layers within the journey of, of, of being in property, you know, having your first one, wanting to be hands-on, you know, adding value, you know what I mean? So if you're able to find a, a property that needs some some refurbishment, you know, you buy it for 100, you spend 20,000 on it, and it's now worth 100 and, 140, something like that, whatever it may be, you know, having that and feeling in control, I, I, I think is, you know, and also just, just trying different skill sets, you know, and see if you can do it, you know, for me, it was really attractive. Um, the property market in itself, again, um, I have always been about, you know, creating a product that's better than the rest in the local market, you know, because when, when, you know, all said and done, you know, uh, what's that property show? It's called location, location, location. And there's the reason why it's, why it's named that three times, because it's that important if you are going to be in property. So for me, you know, it depends on the level of seriousness, you know, property is always a great long-term asset you know long term um if you are a cold heart invest cold hard investor and you look at actually the you know the, the cumulative returns of the capital you know for example even within london a property buying seven years ago the actual compounding you think that great on a on a year to year you know um roi but really again if you're wanting to have passive income you know, and and actually, you know, have that, you know, whatever it may be, goal of ten thousand pounds a month, uh, or, or whatever it may be, that's a really good vehicle that you can leverage and utilize um, and grow. Um, for starters, you know, you've just got to get in amongst it. You know, do something simple and basic. It could be as simple as a, you know, really nice, you know, one bedroom, two bedroom flat in your local area, and actually show that that it works for you. Um, and making sure that you actually leave yourself profit margin at the end of each month, etc. You know, relative to rent costs and and and, and tax, etc. Um, but really, you know, I would say if you're just going to be an accidental landlord, it's probably you know that's why it's called accidental. You know, you've inherited something and you've got it. Um, 
you know, do not rely on that um, on building that as a business. But if you want a career property in itself, you know, where you build up that, that portfolio or you create a lettings agency or you want to become an estate agency and, 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 and build a business around that sector, then look, the world's your oyster. Um, but the key thing is for me is, you know, um, and then the journey then continues, you know, if you want to get into commercial or, or big developments or, or, or wherever, you know, where the big, you know, what's the word, high risk, high reward um, uh, aspects of the property sector come, then yes, it's all there. And there is a, a journey if you want to grow. But if you're just starting out, then you want to start out, you know, very in, in the basics um, and, and do it with minimal risk. Um, and the UK, again, is just a, it's a great market for that. Um, you know, with with you know, since World War II, a massive demand of of uh, of, of rental needed. You know, the population is, is is massive compared to the actual housing allocation or the housing quantity that we have. So, you know, from a, it's not going to set the world on fire these days. You know, you're not going to be getting yields of twenty percent or anything like that. Um, but you will be able to, you know, uh, hopefully beat inflation when inflation's normal <laughs> of around about three to four percent and so if you're doing that you're winning um obviously you know it's been a bit of a rocky time for for us landlords um in in the last sort of couple of years but again markets are cyclical you know this is what happens and an actual fact owning assets over a long long term is 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 very beneficial for wealth yeah i love that as you say it's part of a, a journey and I've I talked to a number of investors who've literally just bought one property, gone through a huge learning curve, getting there, getting it all up and running, and then they stop. Mm. You just, you've le learned so much on your first one. Your second one's going to be easier, and your third one's going to be easier. And it just gets easier as you keep going, where a lot of people get put off after a first initial bad experience. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, but again, you know, I think this is what unfortunately people think that, that, that oh, oh, because it's so easy accessible, what I would call the, the property sector, you know, for really for anybody. And that's that's the amazingness of the UK. You know, you can go and get a buy to let mortgage and, and you don't need to know much and, and crack on with it. Right. If you've got a deposit or whatever it may be. And just because it's easy accessible, it doesn't mean like, for example, I'm going to turn up to my dentist and start being a, you know, a full blown dentist because I've learned something in a week. And now I've suddenly, you know, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing fillings and, 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 you know, facial surgery or whatever it may be. That doesn't happen like that. Right. So just because it's easily accessible doesn't necessarily mean you're going to see the rewards. And so, you know, it is a journey. And and if you are serious about actually it being, you know, part of your pension and your 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 portfolio in, in that, you know, your your investment portfolio as a, as a person, um, you know, then then great. You've got to be serious about it. You know, this is not about being, you know, like I say, you know, popping in, doing one being a, it's a bit, bit, you know, being a bit disappointed because it took a lot of effort. Look, you know, anything in life takes, you know, to be successful takes a lot of effort. And unfortunately, the only way you learn is through pain uh, and mistakes. Um, and we have all been there. And, and, and then again, you know, but it does get easier because at the end of the day, you know, with property or any business, you get to know the right people around you. Do you know what I mean? So like, for example, build teams, you find one who are great. Okay, brilliant. Now I'm going to look after them. I'm going to pay them on time. So when I do other ones, that becomes easier and easier and easier. You know, likewise, you know, lawyers, you find a decent lawyer. Unfortunately with them, they can get busy if they're really decent. So you have to change them every blooming two years anyway. So, so that philosophy doesn't work, but you know, um, you end up learning what does good look like. And so therefore you become more efficient with even bringing on new people, you know? So, you know, look, it is a journey. Um, and as I say, it's not something that you should ever walk into thinking it's going to be easy. You know, everybody talks about it. It's worthwhile. Yes. But so is everything that you put effort and time into. And uh, as I say, the property sector in itself um, finding those deals, finding, you know, something that, that that facilitates your future and dreams, then, you know, brilliant. There aren't many other sectors that can do that. So that's why property for me is is, is the the mainstay of my of my portfolio. It's the mainstay of my pension and and will continue to be so. Um, so yeah, that's that's <laughs> just walk into it knowing that 
great effort, you know, produces great rewards, but you have to be ready for putting that work in. Yeah, and take a few risks and love it. So actually, so if you move on to sourcing investments a little bit now, so from an, an investor's perspective, both a new investor or an existing landlord, you might have a portfolio of properties. How, mm. how can sourcing investments actually help them? So we, you know, so for example, you know, a lot of people are very nervous around what I would call, um, well, let's go back. Most landlords operate within their own portfolio within, I would say, I think the average is something like five to 15 miles of their house, something like that. And that is just simply down to that feeling of control that they, they need. Um, and, and people say that, and I challenge that always by saying, well, um, if the boiler breaks, what are you going to do? You're going to be going down there and fixing that? And you're like, no. So you're going to call somebody up. So, so ultimately, if you have the right people and systems that you can call upon, if you are based in Ballon in London and you can buy a two-bedroom flat for five hundred to 700000 and you're getting a yield of 3%, and this is simply about investing in capital deployment and, and, and return on investment, why would you not deploy that capital um, across three properties based up in, you know, you know, the Northeast, you know, somewhere like, you know, Newcastle or Sunderland or somewhere that actually has a high demand for, let's say, for example, next to a hospital or something. And you know that that's going to continue to rent all day long. Why would you not deploy that capital over three properties, which is making three times or, you know, what I would call at least double the ROI of what you're, you're getting um, down in Ballam? Because, you, again, if you get a call, um, you know, what are you going to do? <laughs> fix fix the boiler? No. So for me, um, you know, that's what we do is we also bring in when you have that local knowledge is bringing you're not going to know that Mrs. Miggins down the street in Sunderland is about to sell three of her properties that she's just had for 10 years and wants to sell them quickly. Again, that, that line of sight to opportunity is something that is, you know, unless you're on the ground doing it yourself constantly, you will not be plugged in. And so a lot of investors end up finding that when they do go down that path, they then find that once they've plugged into the local, what I would call area, community, agents, you know, they get this, this gluttony of, of, of potential, you know, pro prospects and, and investments. What do they then do with it? How can you actually monetize those funnels that you've created or contacts that you you have in that area? And that's where a lot of people end up becoming sources. Um, and so the question is, is that how can people with money, which unfortunately most people with money don't have the time to do all of this, you know, sort of uh, finding of the deals themselves. So how can we link what I would call capital and the opportunity? Because normally, one, you know, these people are wanting to find people with capital and these people with capital don't have the time to find the opportunities. And that is ultimately what we have, we've created, a platform with communication, um, with a communication system, uh, monetary moving system, which allows, as I say, not for the acquisition of the actual property, because that's done through lawyers, but for the fees of services for, for the sourcing agents. You know, again, that's protected in an escrow service. So the investor can only release that when they are happy that the, the, the deal is done normally upon completion so really just providing lots of processes systems and security tools around that process so ultimately an investor can find line of sight to you know local opportunities in a um, hundred and i think we, we've got 122 sources around the country wow. so these are people who you know, ultimately are, are trying to find capital in order, you know, whether it be in South Wales or, or South London or in the Southwest or up in the Northeast, you know, these are potential line of sight to opportunities that you won't be able to replicate yourself. Now, what I would point out is saying that ultimately as investor, you have to take that responsibility of doing your own analysis. These are potential deals, but you as an investor also have to learn how to be able to analyze these deals, work out the risk for yourself, because at the end of the day, even with people who are providing these, the sourcing agents, um, you know, they are not allowed to talk about ROI. They're not allowed to. That's that's something when you move down to, you know, your investment advisory, which is, you know, completely in contrast to the FCA and being an investment manager. They are not. 
Um, and in actual fact, even in the you know, pension and fund world, you know, you, you can't claim what you're going to, you know, do an ROI or, or your investment. So ultimately, as an investor, you still have to understand, you know, what is your cost base? What is it going to, you know, bake into account, you know, overspend on margin if you're, if you're you know, doing a build or, or, or a renovation, et cetera. You ultimately are responsible. And so what we end up doing, and the key thing is for that, is having transparency. And that's the thing that the investment sector is lacking, transparency and accountability. So that's what we have provided by making sure that the agents, what they are providing is accountable to them. You know, if they are saying that it is a, we've seen it over the years, um, right at the very start, where sometimes you would have like, for example, a property and they were stating it's, it's freehold. Uh, and it wasn't. And you're like, okay, that may not change what I would call the investment outcome, but isn't that kind of a fundamental sort of premise that I think I'm walking into a freehold property when in actual fact it's leasehold? And there's nobody marshalling this. There is nobody blowing the... Well, and again, it could have been a mistake. It might not have been a mistake. It could have been you know, window dressing something up a little bit more, but... We have seen so many challenges over the years that unfortunately investors have to face, um, but also on the flip side, the agents, sourcing agents have to face, dealing with investors who are not ready, who claim that they have the money ready, who waste a lot of their time on the ground. So again, the only way to shine a light on that is to provide transparency and accountability through a communication system so everybody knows what was said. We're not here, we are basically like an Amazon we are here to facilitate both sides of the ecosystem and build both of those out. And at the moment, we you know we have around about 25,000, 26,000 investors uh, on the system. And again, about 120, 100, yeah, 120, 122 agents on the system. Um, you know, and obviously we're, we're 200 investors a month are joining. We're always bringing on more more sourcing agents. So you know we're growing that. And I think in total, so over the last seven years. I think we've we done about 85 to 86 million pounds worth of property with the average sale price being around about 90,000. So it, it it works, but again, other factors you know, that include is, is like, for example, the economy at the moment, everybody buying you know, uses leverage. So with high interest rates, that's definitely slowed down the investment market, which we can see firsthand. But we do have data and insights that you'll never find anywhere else um, no right move, no agents. We see it on a national level, what's going on, where, how, why, and data. And uh, that's something that drives our business, which is very much data orientated. So, yeah, we're in quite a unique position. You are indeed. Yeah, I love that. You're, you're just the platform between the investors and the, the sources. Could, regarding sourcing agents, as you say, because it does seem to be very unregulated. Anybody can go on a little training course and then suddenly decide they're a property sourcer. How... How do you deal with that as the platform? So one of the things is, you know, we we can't regulate the what I would call the actual knowledge on the, what I would call the facilitation. You know, um, for example, we see a lot of people come out, uh, like you said, of a, of a training course or even like a stay agent who think they know, you know, how an investment works. And I think just uh, one of my funny stories is always when an estate agent, you know, comes to me when I'm actually in buying mode and they say, this is a great deal, you know, you, you, you know, and my first question back to them is, well, if it's such a great deal, why don't you do it? You know, um, oh, that's right. You don't know how to. Um, so, you know, for me, we make sure that we mitigate the risk by one of the products that we have is called the compliance vault. And it makes sure that, that an agent, no matter what is their experience, because you can actually get some really, uh, you know, um, you know, agents that have come out training and are really keen. They they've understood what's the word. The, the 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 they may have come from a professional background, you know, corporate whatever, and they understand how to operate. But again, if you if you you know if you are judging somebody just simply on their years of experience, I can tell you that does not follow suit in this sector. Um, so because they can find a really decent opportunity and not really know it, which is fantastic yep. with their enthusiasm. But what is key is making sure that they themselves are fully compliant. And when I say compliant, 
there are four bodies that you need to be registered with, um, including uh, HMRC, um, and they have to understand how to do anti-money laundering checks, um, KYC checks, which is know your client, because unfortunately all agents are responsible for that. When the investor comes in, they have to make sure that money um, isn't from, uh, you know, what we call um, uh, areas that we that that, that are deemed uh, and you know money laundering, etc. Yeah. So again, we provide those services and access to that. Um, so we are doing our bit massively for the industry by making sure that that actually also is a is 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 not so much of a burden for them. So with all the systems processes, we even provide um, through our. Uh, we took a year and a half working with an insurance um, company to a huge one uh, from Lloyd's, Lloyd's of London, um, to provide proper dedicated professional indemnity insurance for these guys. So again, you know, the transparency of communication, all of the compliance, all of the professional indemnity insurance, you know, these things are put in place. So no matter what they do, everything that they do do can be seen, if it does go wrong, which unfortunately, this is life, it does. And likewise, it goes wrong for the investor. Everything can be identified, can be facilitated, can be communicated with, with each other, or we can facilitate what we call a, a, you know, a solution. But at the end of the day, to give you an idea, over the last, I would say, seven years, we've had 19, 19 problems, um, of which all of them have, have, have gone through our resolution service, and we've found an amicable solution. Um, and normally it just boils down to making people talk, you know, without getting emotion in the way. So I think one had didn't get resolved and it had to be escalated to um to the to the ombudsman or something like that. But again, that's just me being honest and real. You know, this is about life. It it doesn't go perfectly. But the key thing is, is how do you work together to make sure that there is a solution found? So I think, you know, with all of this, we provide that and a framework of professionalism of which any sorting agent, whether they are super experienced, if they are not, can plug into because that is what is lacking in this industry across the board. Mm. And the horror shows that we see, and more importantly, when it does happen or bad things happen, and we're talking on deals that, that are multi-million pounds, we're talking on deals that are worth 50,000 pounds or whatever it may be. You know what? The authorities really don't care. They don't care. Um, because unfortunately, you know, they're either too busy, uh, you know, et cetera. I mean, we had a case where we actually had proof of, of fraud and we actually sent that proof of fraud. Uh, to give you the context, a sourcing agent basically built a, um, uh, an extension um, and, uh, which was unauthorized um, on, by, by the investor. They just built an extra £40,000 extension and then they literally bullied them they bullied the investor off, you know, it was, it was, it was really bad to pay up that up, even though they didn't ask for it. Um, there was a little bit of other fraud going on with bills not being paid. And then, and then the investor actually paid. It was just, it was just a nightmare. And we had all of this evidence and we provided it to, um, I believe, uh, a Northwest police force. I won't say which one. And they didn't care. Uh, the ombudsman didn't care. The HMRC didn't care. Nobody cared. And this is the problem with it all. We are here to help bring that transparency. Uh, and more importantly, as I say, provide that insurance cover as well, um, which allows if things do go wrong, then obviously you've, there is insurance cover. But in order to have insurance cover, you have to prove what, how, why, where. And we also provide that as well. So that's why we are so passionate about providing this service so that, you know, this, this, dark you know gray industry not just in property sourcing but just property in general has a light shined on it and and and, and it will only make it better over the long term love it yeah so you're basically ensuring the compliance of all the sources with professional indemnity insurance making sure they're members of property redress scheme that sort of thing yeah. so yeah. every source or every deal on your site has already gone through that checklist to get up there and, and, you know, and again, it's it's like anything. We're not here to monitor everything. We're here to provide an ecosystem that people can actually communicate effectively through um, and bring the right people together. And it is on them. It is on them. We're just here as a facilitator. But again, you just have to make sure that, you know, say 
T's and C's are, you know, are followed. Um, and, and we're here to just, as I say, our, our biggest weapon is transparency. Um, that's account and which therefore leads to accountability. And, and that's something we've always been passionate from the start. Um, and, and that drives us every day. So how can we make it better? What, what, what makes it easier for people? Um, but at the end of the day, what it doesn't remove is the responsibility of the investor for doing their own due diligence. What it doesn't do is remove the responsibility and professionalism of an individual agent, for example, who, you know, should get back to a client within, you know, within a few hours, in my opinion, you know, not waiting two days, you know, et cetera. So again, there, there are things in our control, there are things out of our control, but what we are doing is making the sector better and have been doing that every single year that we, we are around. And, uh, you know, and that's proven by what we do and, and how we go about it. Brilliant stuff. Yeah, I can see that from a sourcing perspective, the importance of having all that, that compliance in place. Uh, I'm just wondering then, looking at it from the, the investor's side, do you do any sort of, um, yeah, how, how do you actually work with investors? So from our side, in actual fact, uh, we used to have a very closed system. So, you know, registration, you only could come in and, and see behind by registering and, and, and stuff like that. And, uh, and that worked really well. Um, but we got to a point where we were realizing, unfortunately, um, investors like what I would call um, to flirt, but they don't want to dive in for the kiss, right? And and then unfortunately, what we what we what we realized we we then changed the system and 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 upgraded it and we opened it up and 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 I was really, you know, as the CEO I was very reluctant around that because it, it felt as though we were opening ourselves up to what I would call anybody. Um, and when I say just anybody, we're talking about uh, cyber attacks. I mean, when you're a FinTech company, um, you know, these things are real um, and you have to spend a lot of money, uh, uh, you know, protecting that and protecting data, et cetera. Um, anyway, we did it and we've actually seen a massive uptick, which has been really good of, of investors actually joining because they can actually see the properties openly um you know and and that's been really good we've also opened up the ease of communication um pathways so being able to you know contact the the agents in multiple ways now rather than just only through our communication systems um and what we've been able to do is protect the investor and, and the agent themselves through through up leveling our terms and conditions and you know non-circumvent clauses and all kinds of stuff like that at the end of the day you know if you treat people like children they'll behave like children if you treat them like adults they'll, they'll behave like adults so that you know again it was quite nervous doing that um and, and and really from the investor side again you know putting it out some a lot of you know investors don't know what they want until they see it you mm -hmm. know so actually you know we do go out to our investor database uh, i think on a six monthly basis or quarterly basis now um asking them what they want because we want to be proactive to be able to tell the agents, right, this is what the demand is. You know, it could be two bedroom buy to lets in Liverpool, for example, you know, and that's what, you know, um, go and find it, you know, because when, when, when you've got something, a demand that, you know, you can go fit the supply to that demand rather than agents being out there finding, you know, a really good in investment and throwing it on, I would use the expression, you know, throwing shit at a wall and hoping it sticks. You know, we're trying to turn this into a more of a uh, an alignment between what the demand is and, and then therefore matching the supply. And that's worked really well, you know, um, by, by moving into that model. Um, you know, it's not perfect. There's still obviously that element of if agents will upload and they will get bites. You know, I think the average, the property page on average gets in the region of about, I think it's about two and a half to three and a half thousand views a month. Um, so again, there's a lot of visibility, um, you know, for agents and they always say, you know, and on the flip side, you know, for agents always talking about, oh, you know, uh, what, what, you know, how many properties do you sell a month? I'm like, no, 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 it's not us. It's, it's, uh, what properties do you sell a month? Because, yeah. you know, there is no fixed and perfect investment for an investor. There is not, they all have different strategies, different risk profiles, different areas that they focus on. And so at the end of the day, it's just a matter of, uh, you know, being consistent in finding good deals. And that means good relative to your area, because 
a good deal in London is not necessarily a high yielding. It's not going to tick the box for high yielding, but you might have potential of some really good um, whatever we'll capital uplift after a refurb, for example. Um, likewise, if you compare that to a property up in Liverpool, you know, um, uh, in general, a two bedroom flat in Liverpool, you know, you should be getting a yield really of, of probably eight to, you know, nine percent. You know, you really should, which is probably double that in London. But again, you're not necessarily going to get the, 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 you know, huge capital uplift. So, again, what I say to agents is you have to throw yourself out there. And one of the things we do provide is, is, is a website for them with their live deals. So not only do their live deals go to our databases, it goes, you know, they can use it as their own. Um, and again, I'm not sure many people are aware, but actually you know, building your own sort of website with listings and the cost of that, even just to build it you know, it's probably two to, I don't know, five grand. Never mind, you've got to be updating it all the time or paying somebody else to update it. So we provide that to agents. We are literally doing everything that we can in order to make this ecosystem, you know, be more efficient, more effective and, and, and more visibility and eyes on it. And that will lead to sales and ultimately revenue for everybody in the food chain. Mm. Am I right in thinking you can actually have a, a white label page? So if I was sourcing a number of properties, I could actually have a page on your website. Right, correct. Designed around well, it's your own, yeah. So we host it within it. Um, you get your own. So, you know, the uh, David Properties, you know, whatever it may be, um, uh, or sourcinginvestments.co.uk forward slash David Properties, and, and that would be it, you know. So it's white labeled. It looks like you. Everything's the same, but it actually feeds into the bigger, the bigger, um, the bigger system, which is, you know, a benefit to you, more eyeballs on it. Um, but more importantly, it gives you a page to be massively professional, massively contactable. And that's that's the two biggest things that, that people look for, you know, in any business, you know, professionalism and being able to, you know, have, have the ability to contact that business. So, yeah, we've provided all of that to all the agents. And uh, as I say, yeah, it's not, in my opinion, not used enough. Um, that, that That's the problem. Right. But that really didn't then comes down to the professionalism of the agents etc and and how eager they are to 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 you know grow their business and you know for me we've got some massive success stories you know of some agents who really go after it and make it a professional business and, it, and it's fantastic to be a part of that journey with them love it and so can you walk us through the the path for many investors so somebody jumps onto sourcing investments website for the first time sees a deal that they, they like the look of how, how does it actually work from from there so they see a deal that they look you know and they'll have data on there which include you know sort of projected rental income what the property is what the strategy is um and everything else around it where it's located etc so they're able to do their own due, due diligence that's for sure um, if that is, you know, does pique their interest, they're able to click, you know, a couple of buttons to contact the sourcer through the system. Um, and even, you know, uh, I think now we even have the capacity to, to WhatsApp them if you really want to annoy them, um, which, again, some of the agents have that capacity to turn on and turn off. So not all of them have that, you know, um, because they don't want, you know, being woken up in the middle of the night from an investor from, you know, Singapore or something like that, expecting a uh, three minute response at 3 a.m. in the morning, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, so facilitating that. Yeah. And then obviously that that is where the relationship then starts with the sourcing agent. But the investor then has the confidence in knowing that this person or this business is regulated. You know, from the compliance perspective, they have oversight, you know, uh, or have oversight, you know, through us. Um, and they know that they are of a caliber of individual and 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 have that you know compliance um, uh, framework around them. So that's what gives them the confidence. And then from there on, you know, if there is uh, a real interest in the property, putting in offers um, um, and uh, I'm getting that accepted. And then at that point, we the agent will then work with this with the investor to utilize what we call our escrow services, which is basically like a client account to hold money in. So this, for example, if there is a sourcing fee that they will charge of say £5,000, something like that, that yeah. fee will then be deposited into our escrow for that deal purposely um, and held there until the deal is complete. And what this therefore does is protects the investor's money so the agent doesn't just run off with it and decides to go on a, you know, five star holiday to Marrakesh or something for a week. Um, and that gives them the confidence in knowing that only then when they authorize it, it's released. So and then from the agent's perspective, a lot of them can't get 
these client accounts now. It's been proving really hard for them to actually get them, um, including estate agents and lettings agents these days, which is really sad. That's just due to bureaucracy in the in the system, in the flow, not our system, but in the in the industry. Um, banking, what you have to you know go through and jump hoops now to get a bank account. Um, and so we actually provide that service for them. Um, and and they know then that that money is there, subject to them obviously then you know facilitating and getting that deal completed. Um, likewise, that that same process of of us being the middle um, entity who is independent of the deal gives everybody confidence in knowing that that is there. Um, we also provide that service for the renovation, so subject to a project plan being um, uh, uh, what's the word agreed between the sourcing agent uh, who could be the project manager for uh, for refurbishment on a deal and the and the investor we provide that service again to hold the money so everybody knows it's there it's agreed and then also the investor can release it upon you know hitting certain key milestones of the project plan so again you know we're trying to do everything possible to be able to invest you know securely from afar um and even if that means you know even from london to birmingham which isn't you know an hour on the train you can actually do it from your phone and, and, and as i say do everything that you can even if you were investing five minutes down the road from you it's the same thing yep got it and um, one thing i mean because we talked about you know from uh, low yielding properties in london where you probably get more capital appreciation to hmos to buy to lets in the north and i get the impression everybody i talk to uh, all loves their strategy, but whatever it might be. Um, but it can be quite confusing to a new investor. Well, should I go HMO? Should I do that? Do you actually offer any help and advice in getting their strategy sorted in the first place for a new investor? We we don't. Um, at the end of the day, you know, it's a very personal, personal thing. And this is where what I would call training um, in understanding what strategies are out there Um very much comes to the forefront you know you wouldn't you know go and uh, be a you know be a plumber without you know going to do plumber training you know what i mean it's it's really simple so for me no we don't get into that um we um i would say about four years ago um had a mentoring program um actually it was facilitated off off the back of a huge company going into administration um, and we helped a lot of investors, international investors, with their mentoring. Um, and this normally was charged at about £10,000, uh, something like that, which, again, a lot got valued out of it, a lot of value. But unfortunately, this is the problem. You get people who think that, you know, getting into property is really easy. They don't want to spend time on that educational piece. Um, but, you know, it's a bit like, again, using the analogy, it's like, like, you know, go and be a plumber, but you don't have to do the learning, right? Um, and you see what happens. Um, and so no sourcing investments does not get involved in that, whatever you can get line of sight to opportunities, but with regard to what is right for you, that is something that the investor has to go and figure out themselves even before. And my advice would be either, you know, do a lot of research yourself. You can go and learn from a lot of books or even go, you know, to a professional, uh, property training outfit. Um, I'm really going and spending that money so you actually learn how, what, and why. Um, and then once you've done that, then you'll be ready to, you know, it's all about mitigating risk. Um, if you pay for that up front or, you know, if you don't pay for that learning, um, you will pay for it downstream in mistakes and errors. And, and, and you know, that 10 grand might actually turn into, you know, 50 grand of loss and, you know, you can't do anything about it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that it's that that learning and knowledge and treating it as a business rather than I'll just buy a house and invest it and forget about it. Yep. It is, and and it, it you know at the end of the day, if you think about it, these are mini businesses within themselves. So we call it property, but a property in itself has you know um, you know capital expenditure. You know if you're a business, capital expenditure. You know it has income. You know, it has, you know, costs and expenses against it. It, it, it. A property in itself, even if it's a tiny flat or, you know, it's a massive commercial building with 100 flats in it, it is a small business in itself or a big business. And if it's treated like that and you can actually bolt all of these little businesses and get that Ooh. what we call benefit of scaling, you know, cost benefit of scaling, then brilliant. But everything is a small business within itself and you have to treat it like that. 
And if you don't, you know, that's when it can, you know, bite you. Um, and uh, because if you take your eye off eye off any business, it will it will not go to plan. And that's all I would say from an advisory perspective. If you want to walk into this, you know, be ready, be vigilant, treat it as business. It's not playtime. And and you know, if you do that consistently, consistently, you will uh, reap the benefits. And mm. I, I love what you're doing, actually bringing bring in some sort of regulations and compliance and proper insurance in place into a completely unregulated market. So it makes total, total sense for me. Um, one last question I wanted to ask you. If we were going to have a chat again in five years' time, what would you want to be able to say has happened over the next five years with sourcing investments? Good question. I think for me, I think the principles of what, how and what we operate is not just about the UK. This is a, you know, global, it's an international problem, line of sight to opportunities, and then why we're called being able to access them and execute on them transparently. So right now, the reason why this is dark in the background is so I'm in Bali at the moment. And, uh, you know, if I was going to compare the Balinese market uh, and the Indonesian market compared to the UK, um, I mean, growth here, you know, is 30%, you know, um, over the next four years, you know, and and land values have, you know, gone up, you know, to two and a half X, you know, in the last year alone in some areas. Um, and so, you know, it's completely different. Um, so what I would love to be able to do with with sourcing investments, and, and we're going to be doing that, you know, shortly, is actually expanding into different locations to be able to bring line of sight to opportunities, not just to people in the UK, but again, we also have got an international base of, you know, the world is a big place and has a lot of different opportunity. And, you know, multiple occupancy uh, still works here. You know, land or commercial, guess what, still works here. Buy to let still works here. Residential still works here. But getting access to markets that actually, you know, in themselves are growing um, uh, and, you know, could be perceived as slightly higher risk but at the same time, risk versus reward. And the key thing is having the right people on the ground. It doesn't matter if you're investing in Liverpool or London or the UK, the key is people. And if you have the right people on the ground, then anything's possible. Yep. I was going to say, because at the moment, you're just UK focused, aren't you? With the yes. investments you, you've got. Yes. You just say that, that was making my mind spin. Oh my God, the compliance issue. Trying to do that internationally the other way around. <laughs> Ah, uh, but as you say, there's opportunities all over the world. So why why just look at the UK market? Correct, correct. Get that model and just build it, build it elsewhere. Love it. There you go. Cool. That'd be really good talking to you, Chris. Thank you so much for your time. Um, yeah, and I look forward to catching you again shortly. Absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. See uh, you guys soon. Cheers. Hey.